Gente. This is no time for us to be divided. Guyana, unfortunately, has too many races and too many religions. Which is a hunting ground. The 53 election, when Guyana was still under British rule, was a moment of hope. The exploiters and the exploited, the capitalists. Chedi Jagan became prime minister with the support not only from the Indian sugar workers, but from many black Guyanese as well. His People's Progressive Party campaigned strongly on class and poverty rather than on race. But it was avowedly Marxist, and after its second victory at the polls, an alarmed British government sent in the troops, claiming there was a communist plot to take over the country. Britain suspended the constitution. Under this pressure, the PPP split, and the rival PNC, the People's National Congress, was created by Jagan's deputy, Forbes Burnham. Burnham appealed to black voters only. Guyanese politics became disfigured by violence, polarized along the racial divide. Blacks attacked Indians, Indians turned on blacks in reprisal. You have people being murdered, chopped up, shot, strangled, and all these things that happened. I've seen some, and I can tell you, it was frightening. I wouldn't like them to happen again. After independence, the system deteriorated still further. Elections were rigged. All opposition intimidated or thrown into jail. Forbes Burnham held power for 20 years. Teddy Jagan, who arguably still represented the majority, never returned to power. Demands that the voting system should be reformed were either ignored or deflected. Indians themselves became increasingly disillusioned. The result? Stagnation and decay. Many of the most talented Guyanese have left the country to find better opportunities abroad. The tragedy is that Guyana is a country with probably more potential wealth than anywhere in the Caribbean. For hundred years, people have come to the Guyanese rainforest in search of this. Flecks of gold in black sand. Legend had it that somewhere beyond these falls, you would find Indians who ritually rolled their chief in gold and washed him off in the great lake. Golden man the original El Dorado. Ray Rahman is one Indian who isn't waiting for better days. He wants his El Dorado now, and he thinks he's found it. One day, not far from here, we might find either the sunken city or the exposed city of gold. I don't think it was really a city, it was just an abundance of water and creeks and waterfalls flowing into a system where the gold was visible. And that is almost what we have here. This is one of the few parts of the world where you can still call the forest virgin. You see a few other adventures along the river today. But this is gun-toting country. Ray calls it the modern Wild West. He's like the old conquistadors who paddled up these rivers 500 years ago. This is the Wild West. This is the modern Wild West. You've got to be well armed and there are a lot of people around just lurking in the jungle. They have guns too. Huh? There's incidents in this river over the years I've been here where four people have died. They've killed four people already take the gold. Ray's camp is now well established. His bulldozers have cut through the forest 
and carved vast chunks out of the riverbed. Ray is no environmentalist. Environment? Changing the territory of home. Yeah, well, sure. Why not? It's been here a thousand years. No one wants it. It's 83,000 square miles of dense forest. It's time someone gets serious and look around for the deposits, whether it be gold, wood, oil, or whatever. Ray is certainly serious. To help him extract the wealth, he has turned, as the conquistadors did, to the indigenous people, the ones Columbus called Indians. They do the dangerous jobs, like diving. They found spots where the gold was showing down there while they were underneath. And they did not worry about the fact, the danger, that they're going deeper and deeper behind this gold. And all of a sudden, the sides of the hole that they were working in just caved in the sand, were just caving, and then they would be alive, they would still be breathing. But by the time you can bail them out, all that t those tons of sand above them, too late. So they'd last two like that. The settlement is on a site marked on a map that once belonged to a British mining company. Perhaps that's where the kids learn cricket, the indelible tide mark of the British wherever they went in the Caribbean. From Ray, the Indians have got schooling and some medical care. But they've suffered too much at the hands of Europeans in the past not to be suspicious of outsiders now. Gold, as the Spanish discovered, makes everyone suspicious and suspect. Ray trusts his workmen only so long as he can see them. There's no law here in the wild jungle where you could put, take a man to court over stealing your gold and that type of thing, so you just fire them, pay them. They still get away with some, he tells us. There are plenty of tricks, but he's philosophical about it. Why worry? You can be greedy for everything, you know. Came from below. No one put it there, as they say. So they deserve some. They pour mercury into the precious sludge poison to purge the impurities. Then fire to cleanse it. When the mercury is burned away, that's gold, worth 75 pounds an ounce. When I was poor, I did it to get rich. But then, after getting rich, you do it now for the joy of having your own concern, being in charge of your own resources and your own people. And that's the pride and joy of building something from nothing. This is a jungle, and look what it is. We turned it into. One, two, two, seven, eight, eight, seventeen, right? That's uh, 18 pennyweights, 12 grains. I'm going to have myself a cattle ranch, and I'm going to be totally self-sufficient on this um, campsite with agriculture, cattle, and forestry. This is somewhere where you can go on your own little island and live and get away from all the politics and the problems in the outside world. Trinidad, a week before carnival, the ultimate Creole, that to say mixed, experience in the Caribbean. All next week, Savannah will be a blaze of costume and color with people jumping together through the streets, their racial origin irrelevant. It couldn't be farther from Guyana. But carnival can be deceptive. As in Guyana, East Indians are the largest population group in the country, and for generations, they too have felt underrepresented by the political process. Carnival itself is a political occasion. The Calypso singers satirize the government, they comment on political scandals, they give voice to the grumbles and aspirations of ordinary people. Of course, these days, they can do that the whole year round. But the tradition really started during slavery, when carnival was the only time when slaves could mock their masters without fear of being flogged, or worse. 
and deep down that connection between Calypso and slavery is still important. Until recently, carnival didn't really belong to Indians. But these days, all that's changing. In one of those villages, you can find someone who, in their unusual way, is trying to break through the cultural logjam. Drupati, Calypso singer extraordinary, is an unlikely revolutionary. In many ways, her life is that of a typical Indian villager. She and her husband Jay still live in the village where they both grew up. It's 90% Indian and clings to its traditions. In many ways, Drupati does too. I am a shy person outside. If I walk the street, I am a shy person. If I'm home, I'm quiet. I'm a very simple country girl. <laughs> I lived my life in the country and I love the dry in the country. You can sit down and relax. The countryside is where Indian traditions are strongest. Her family is an example. Village life for an Indian girl in Trinidad is strict. Marriages are usually arranged. But she saw Jay, liked him, and took matters into her own hands. Every morning I would, whatever I'm doing, I know exactly what time he used to pass. Around half past him, I used to leave whatever I'm doing inside and come outside. That was my job every morning. <laughs> and in the evening time, I would do the same thing. I would make sure and finish off my work and get outside just to watch Jay passes back. Every year, Hindus celebrate Diwali, the great festival of light. For the older generation, it's a reaffirmation of tradition. But tradition doesn't cut much ice with the young. The basis of Drupati's popularity as a singer is in her own people. She makes Indian songs popular by importing Caribbean rhythms without diminishing the original Indianness. Creolization on her own terms. Listen to this one. Hindi in melody, but with a distinctly Afro-Caribbean rhythm. It's about the tassa, originally a Muslim wedding drum. The tassa, which is a, a series of three pieces of drums, is very fundamental in, in Indian weddings. All Indian weddings, you must have the drum spear, which is the tassa. What we have been trying to get out of our culture is a song with a racy tempo that could uh, parallel the calypso that we have in Trinidad. We were trying to blend the, the two cultures together, the Indian and the calypso, and we were trying to actually attract the young people towards Indian music again because the young people have been tending to go away from the Indian singing because they couldn't dance with the song and there were no tempo with the song. So this is actually what we were trying to do with Tassawale. The following morning, Drupati is back in her role as mother and housewife, cleaning over 200 dyas, the little clay pots which will blaze with light in the village tonight. You come in. Her skill has been to adapt and dilute Indian tradition for the young without debasing it for the older generation among whom she lives. No, don't take up no more. A key to her success has been her own marriage. In a traditional Hindu marriage, the husband is lord and master, whom the wife must obey in all things. Even to contemplate a career, she needed Jay's support. I think he's my best fan, and if it wasn't for Jay, I don't think I would have been where I am. But he helps me a lot, and I depend on him a lot. He knew I had the talent, so he didn't keep me back home to do housework or anything. Tonight's feast is taking place in Jay's father's house. 
For modern young Indians in Trinidad, Diwali is just like Christmas, a time to eat too much, to exchange gifts and have fun. Muslim and Christian friends often join in as well. But as the local school teacher, Jay had to be sure that in helping his wife break with tradition, he wasn't breaking with his family and friends as well. Celebrating Diwali in his parents' home is a mark of respect. Jay's father is a traditionalist, a village shopkeeper who once sweated in the cane fields. Knowing he would have been shocked at the thought of his daughter-in-law planning to be a singer, early on they kept it a secret from him. In our culture, Indian, uh, Indian women are supposed to be at home. We're not supposed to be um, at a job or, or, or doing something that where, where, where they earn an income. So I guess those two reasons was enough for them to say no. Diwali is the triumph of good over evil when Hindus celebrate the return of Lord Krishna after 400 years of exile in the darkness of the forest. When Drupati emerged from this deeply ingrained culture with a determination to sing in public, older people in the village said she was degrading her womanhood. But by staying in touch with her own traditions, she won them over. Her next step was to cross into that other black world of the Calypso tents. Many predicted she would flop that Indians couldn't sing Calypso to blacks and get away with it. Five years on, She's been accepted both in the Calypso tents and in her own village. Everybody liked it. They was dancing to it. Even when I performed it in the tents, they, all they wanted to hear was roll up the tassel, roll up the tassel. That, that, that is what they wanted. Roll up the tassel, roll up the tassel, roll up the tassel, roll up the tassel. I was shocked when I, uh, you know, get in call because, I, I mean, the crowd really loved what I did there. And from then on, you know, they accepted me, and I think now I'm a full-fledged Caribbean. <laughs> Everyone in the Caribbean comes from somewhere else, but the way back to their roots is blocked by history. Drupati's venture won't cure the political tensions, but it is a sign that things are changing. What's unique and original about Caribbean culture is not its origins, but the flowing together of the different traditions that have created it. He was combining the two groups together, both the, um, the, the, the Calypso and the Indian singing. So she was doing something nationally, and we were pro promoting what is called one love in the country, because um, we've got to live here, right? And it's better we do it together than um, we do it separately.